Hi there, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It's January 21st. Today, we celebrate a man known as the Pathfinder and the birthday of a man who impoverished himself writing a book in tribute to Carl Linnaeus. We'll learn about the woman who was as passionate about botany as she was assisting with the war effort in today's National Day that celebrates a garden creature. And here's a hint. It has a bushy tail. Today's unearthed words feature a riddle from an English-American writer and poet, and we grow that garden library with a book that helps us understand the language of flowers. I'll talk about a garden item that comes in handy if you grow houseplants, and then we'll wrap things up with the birthday of a botanist who had an incredible love story and wrote beautiful poems poetry. But first, let's catch up on a few recent events. Here's today's curated articles. First up is a garden article from Savvy Gardening called A Winter Greenhouse, a productive way to harvest vegetables all winter. If you've ever dreamt of harvesting fresh vegetables year-round, this post will inspire you. A Winter Greenhouse is a project worth thinking about, and they share this great tip to keep a heat-generating compost pile Inside the Greenhouse. And Nikki Jabour shares her 10 favorite crops to harvest in winter using her greenhouse. She harvests carrots, beets, scallions, and leeks, winter lettuces, spinach, arugula, mosh, kale, and parsley. If you want to check out this article for yourself, just search for Greenhouse in the Facebook group for the show. Next up was a post from Mother Earth News called 10 Unusual Vegetables for Adventurous Gardeners. Here's the list. Cardoon, which is very similar to a globe artichoke. It's a tall, thistle-like Southern European plant. The leaves and roots can be used as vegetables. Second on the list is Shiso perilla, which is an Asian plant that's in the mint family. Like all mints, it can spread, so be careful if you decide to grow it. And if you're going to explore it, you should check out the stunning red-leafed varieties that are available. Third on the list was Oka, Oka tubers are a South American plant that's related to wood sorrel, and it's a great source of vitamin C. You can eat them raw or cooked like potatoes. Fourth up is celeriac, which is a nutty tasting, hearty winter root. It can be eaten cooked or raw. Number five and six are Malabar spinach and kohlrabi. The cabbage family plant sea kale is in the number seven spot. It's one of my favorites. You can cook the tender stems like asparagus. So this one you would cultivate for its edible young shoots. Amaranth is in the number eight spot. Number nine is winter radish. And then finally, Salsify and Scorzonera make up the number 10 spot. They're very similar plants. They're in the daisy family. Salsify has a long root like that of a parsnip. And the root of Scorzonera has a purpley brown edible root as well. These roots have a sweet flavor that some say reminds them of oysters. And if you grow salsify or scorzonera, you can enjoy them boiled or grated raw. Now, if you want to read more about any of these vegetables, just head on over to the Facebook group and type in the word unusual. And this post will pop up. It was called 10 Unusual Vegetables for Adventurous Gardeners by Mother Earth News. Great post.
Now, if you'd like to check out any of these curated articles for yourself, you're in luck because I share all of them with the listener community in the free Facebook group, The Daily Gardener Community. So you don't need to take notes or track down links. All you have to do is the next time you're on Facebook, just head on up to the search bar, type in Daily Gardener Community and request to join. It's totally free. I'll admit you into the group and I'd love to meet you there. Here's today's brevities. Today is the birthday of the American explorer, soldier, and first presidential candidate of the Republican Party, John Charles Fremont, who was born on this day in 1813. Fremont is remembered as the Pathfinder after helping many Americans who were heading west by creating documents and maps of his expeditions west. John and his wife, Jessie, created an entire map of the Oregon Trail. When Fremont saw Nebraska, he didn't merely see an endless prairie. He saw beauty. To Fremont, the entire state was one big garden, accentuated with fertile soil, swaying grasses, and wildflowers as far as the eye could see. Fremont was one of the first explorers to write about cottonwood trees. He discovered them near Pyramid Lake in Nevada on January 6, 1844. Years later, botanists would name the cottonwood in his honor, calling it the Populus Fremontii. Cottonwoods are the fastest growing trees in North America. After all the beautiful elm trees at my childhood home succumbed to Dutch elm disease, my parents selected cottonwoods as replacements because they knew they would grow quickly, up to six feet or more each year. They couldn't stand how naked the house looked without the beautiful large elm trees. In truth, there's no comparison between a cottonwood tree and an elm, which is regarded as one of the most beautiful trees by landscape painters. In addition, because the cottonwood tree grows so quickly, it often has weak wood that can be easily injured or damaged. Cottonwood trees are in the poplar species. Only the female trees produce the fluffy cotton seeds that float through the air and collect in your garden and garage in June. And today is the anniversary of the death of the English physician and botanical writer Robert John Thornton, who died on this day in 1837. Robert adored Carl Linnaeus. He was a huge fan. And when Robert wrote his book called The Temple of Flora, he dedicated it to Linnaeus. Robert wanted his book to be the very best illustrated book ever made. And his goal was that it would be a memorialization of Linnaeus's work. Robert's idea was to have 70 large plates of exotic plants that would be organized according to Linnaeus's classification system. Another unique aspect of Robert's illustration concept was that the plants would appear in their native environment. Unfortunately, after working with the very best illustrators of his time, Robert had to stop production on the Temple Book after only 28 plant illustrations. He ran out of money and the project stalled, yet even in its unfinished state, it remains one of the most excellent compilations of botanical illustrations that has ever been created. 
Although Robert was overly ambitious with his goals for the Temple of Flora, the work is still considered to be one of the loveliest botanically illustrated books in the world. The most famous engraving in the book is of a night-blooming Sirius cactus plant. The bloom takes up almost the entire width of the image, and in the background, in the dark, you can see the ruins of a castle. The night-blooming Sirius is known as the queen of the night. The flowers don't last long, but they are stunning. The night-blooming Sirius is native to Arizona in the Sonoran Desert, most people would be surprised to know that night-blooming Siriuses can get to be 10 feet tall. Outside the Southwest, the Sirius is generally known as a houseplant. If you're waiting for your Sirius plant to bloom, just know that it won't start flowering until it's at least five years old. And initially, you may only get one or two blooms for a few years. That said, once you do get a flower, you'll be in love because the bloom is seven inches across and the scent is heavenly. And today is the birthday of Dame Helen Gwen Vaughn, a prominent English botanist and mycologist. She was born on this day in 1879. Gwen Vaughn also helped form the University of London's Suffrage Society, where she was the first female professor. During World War I, she also helped establish the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps. Due to her extraordinary wartime leadership, she was one of the first women to receive a military commander of the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire Award. Early on in her botanical career, Gwyn Vaughn researched rust fungi. Rust is a plant parasite that invades a plant and uses it as a host for its survival. Rust actually invades the plant cells and it steals nutrients from the plant. The plant treats the rust like an infection. Sometimes the plants are able to fight off the rust and other times the rust wins and the plants succumb to the rust. Rust destroys 15 million tons of wheat each year. The University of London recently released a lovely article about Gwen Vaughn called Fungi and the Forces, which revealed that Gwen Vaughn was as accomplished in the armed forces as she was in the theater of fungi. In fact, a handful of fungi are named for her, like Paleo Indigoni Gwenvonii and Plurage Gwenvonii. Today is National Squirrel Appreciation Day, which was founded back in 2001 by Christy Hargrove, a wildlife rehabilitator in Asheville, North Carolina. Christy created this day to acknowledge that food sources for squirrels are scarce in midwinter. Gardeners are generally of two minds when it comes to squirrels. They either don't mind them or they really dislike them. Squirrels can be a challenging pest in the garden because of their tremendous athleticism. Squirrels have a five-foot vertical, and nowadays their ability to leap is well documented on YouTube. And squirrels are excellent sprinters and swimmers. They're master zigzaggers when they run, a skill that comes in handy when they need to evade predators. A squirrel nest is called a dray. Squirrels make their nests with leaves, and the mother lines the inside of the dray with grass. Squirrels perform an essential job for trees. They help the forest renew itself by caching seeds and burying them. 
the caching of seeds by squirrels is vital for many tree species. As squirrels bury acorns and other seeds, they either sometimes forget or simply don't return to some of their buried food. Although squirrels have a tremendous ability to source buried food and they can smell an acorn buried in the ground beneath a foot of snow. In unearthed words, today's poem is a winter riddle from the English-born American biographer James Parton. The answer is snow. From heaven I fall, though from earth I begin. No lady alive can show such a skin. I'm bright as an angel and light as a feather, but heavy and dark when you squeeze me together. Though candor and truth in my aspect I bear, yet many poor creatures I help to ensnare. Though so much of heaven appears in my make, the foulest impressions I easily take. My parent and I produce one another, the mother, the daughter, the daughter, the mother. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, The Language of Flowers by Vanessa Diffenbaugh. Today's book is a fiction book. Vanessa weaves the Victorian language of love into a love story. Honeysuckle for devotion, asters for patience, and of course, red roses for love. For the main character, Victoria Jones, flowers are the most useful way of communicating mistrust and solitude. After a childhood spent in the foster care system, her only connection to the world is through flowers and their meanings. Now 18 and emancipated from the system with nowhere to go, Victoria realizes she has a gift for helping others through the flowers she chooses for them. An unexpected encounter with a mysterious stranger forces her to confront a painful secret from her past. Brigitte Weeks of the Washington Post gave my favorite review of this book. She said, I would like to hand Vanessa Diffenbaugh a bouquet of Bovardia for enthusiasm, gladiolas for you pierce my heart, and lysianthus for appreciation. And there's one more sprig I should add to her bouquet, a single pink carnation, meaning I will never forget you. This is a lovely fiction book for gardeners who are looking for something light and fun to read over the winter. This book came out in 2012. You can get a used copy of The Language of Flowers by Vanessa Diffenbaugh and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for under $1. And here's today's great gift for a gardener. It's a 10-pack of 6-inch clear plastic plant saucers. Each saucer measures 6 inches at the top and almost 5 inches at the bottom. This little 10-pack of saucers comes with a 90-day warranty, and you can get the 10-pack of 6-inch clear plastic plant saucers for indoor or outdoor plants and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for $9.49. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. Today is the birthday of the Washington, D.C.-based USDA botanist, Erwin Frank Smith, who was born on this day in 1854. Smith had attempted to solve the problem 
of the peach yellows. Peach yellows is a disease caused by a microorganism called a phytoplasma, and it was affecting peach orchards. It became known as the peach yellows because the main symptom begins with new leaves that have a yellowish tint. Had Smith solved the problem of the peach yellows, he would have become world famous, but he didn't. Years later, it was actually the botanist Louis Otto Kunkel who discovered that a type of leafhopper was carrying the disease. Now, Smith may not have solved the peach yellows problem, but he was a peach of a guy. In researching Smith, I discovered a rare combination of kindness and intellect. He developed a reputation for hiring and promoting female botanists as his assistants at the Bureau of Plant Industry in Washington, D.C., Smith gave these women tasks based on their strengths instead of their job descriptions, and in many cases, they were able to work on projects beyond the scope of their job description. Smith's friend Rodney True revealed Smith's unique combination of strengths in a tribute after he died. He wrote, Irwin developed a knowledge of French, German, and Italian literature that opened to him worlds of intense pleasure. He read his Bible in a copy of the Vulgate, and Dante was a favorite in Dante's own great language. Goethe was often quoted in the original, and seldom have I known a man who brought such joy and understanding to the works of great writers. His library was a sort of map of his mind. In it were all manner of noble things. He was quick, enthusiastic, and strangely appealed to by beauty in all its forms. The happiest day in Smith's life was no doubt when he married the pretty Charlotte May Buffett on April 13th, 1893. They shared an epic love for each other and for reading and poetry. Tragically, after 12 years of marriage, Charlotte was diagnosed with endocarditis. She died eight months later on December 28th, 1906. Smith dealt with his grief by putting together a book of poetry, stories, and a biography of Charlotte. The book is called For Her Friends and Mine, a book of aspirations, dreams, and memories. Smith wrote, This book is a cycle of my life. Seven lonely years are in it. The long ode on page 62 is a cry of pain. And there are many touching passages in this book, too many to share here now, but if you'd like to check it out, I'll put a link to it in today's show notes. But there's one passage from Smith where he describes Charlotte's fantastic ability to attune to the natural world. And I thought you'd find it as touching as I did when I first read it. Charlotte's visual powers were remarkable. They far exceeded my own. Out of doors, her keen eyes were always prying into the habits of all sorts of living things. Ants, spiders, bees, wasps, fish, birds, cats, and dogs. Had she cared for classification, which she did not, and been willing to make careful records, she might have become an expert naturalist. Form in nature seemed to interest her little, or at least comparative studies of form. 
What did interest her tremendously was the grade of intelligence manifested in the lower forms of life. She would spend hours watching the habits of birds and insects and never without discovering new and interesting things. Whether she looked at the tops of the tallest trees or the bottom of a stream or the grass at her feet, she was always finding marvels of adaptation to wonder at and links binding the world of life into a golden hole. She made lists of all the birds that visited her neighborhood. She knew most of them by their songs and sometimes distinguished individuals of the same species by little differences in their notes, as once a song sparrow at Wood's Hole, which had added two notes to its song. She knew when they nested and where, how they made their nests, and what food they brought to their young. In studying birds, she used an opera glass, not a shotgun. She was, however, a very good shot with the revolver. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. The Daily Gardener is produced weekdays in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. You can find complete show notes over at thedailygardener.org and be sure to share the show with your garden friends. You can find The Daily Gardener on all your favorite social media, Instagram, Twitter, and Pinterest, and of course, Facebook. While you're over at Facebook, don't forget to join The Daily Gardener community. Just search for these three words, Daily Gardener Community. The group will pop right up and then request to join. Finally, I want to thank my team at Podfly Productions, where my fabulous editor is Eric Begay. Have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow.